Good evening. I hope you can all hear me. I am letting people in uh, as I was talking to you at the same time. So I'm very glad you could join us. Um, for those of you who have never met me or have met me and quite understandably wish to forget me, then uh, let me remind you uh, that, that my name is Steve Tarrett. Um, I'm the director of the British Law Centre. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome you here tonight. Um, we're delighted to be organizing this event uh, along with the Ko No Okobi uh, of Intellectual Property at the University of Warsaw. And um, everyone from, from the Ko No Okobi has been extremely helpful. But uh, in particular, I'd like to single out uh, Maciej Kurkowski and Kasper Manasterski. Uh, who have been absolutely fantastic in terms of their cooperation. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I would also like to extend our sincere thanks to our other co-host, which is SSW Pragmatic Solutions. Now, SSW has supported the British Law Centre for a number of years uh, and is an extremely valued partner of ours. So, so thank you very much. And, um, SSW has supported us, not just by, not just us, I should say, but, but, but you, our, our students, um, by doing lectures, workshops, and even, not infrequently, offering employment to these students uh, in one of the very many uh, departments that, that exist at, at SSW. So if you're interested in becoming a lawyer or a tax advisor, business consultant, Financial advisor, SSW does it all, um, and uh, it's, it's a great place to, to, to work. So um, look out for not just our website and Facebook page, but for SSWs too. Um, now, SSWs partners, I'd like to say, say thanks to all of them. I'll be saying thanks to a particular partner uh, a little bit later on. But uh, first of all, thanks, thanks to everyone at SSW. Uh, and thank you incredibly to Sylvia Legutska Kosidar who is SSW's Director of Human Resources, uh, for her incredible help in, in organizing uh, this event and the many various ways in which SSW and the British Law Center cooperate. Now, last but certainly not least, uh, is someone that I would like to say a huge thank you to, and that's our speaker this evening, without whom there would be nothing to introduce. So, Thank you very, very much to Katarzyna Stuttlik, who is one of the partners uh, at SSW. Now, Kasia advises on, on all types of issues related in particular to personal data protection, to privacy, to new technologies laws. Um, so she deals with all kinds of clients and all kinds of issues, but the clients are usually very powerful and often very famous ones. Uh, and their problems are usually very complicated. So that means that Kasia has built up an enormous body uh, of practical uh, expertise and experience in, in these areas of law. And tonight, she's going to talk to us about the GDPR and the impact of the GDPR on online marketing in, in Europe. Um, she's going to discuss some of the core issues underlying the GDPR, but also some more detailed and complicated practical issues based on, on her real life experience. Uh, there'll be something for everyone during this session and there'll be time for questions at the end. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box, um, but uh, Kasia will be, will be dealing with them at the end. So for now, enough of my voice, let's hand over to our special guest. Kasia, thank you so much for joining us this evening and floor is yours. Thank you, Steve. Uh, hi, guys. I'm very pleased that I'm able to talk to you today. It's my pleasure to be the guest of, the, of this lecture, and I hope I will tell you something new and something interesting about GDPR and online marketing um, in Europe, uh, but of course, most in Poland. So I, I see that we have almost 90 participants, so I'm overwhelmed by this number, especially because um, in those times, uh, frankly speaking, I am a little bit um, tired 
of having webinars. Uh, I'm a very social and, and very direct uh, person, so I prefer direct contact, face-to-face -face contact. So um, because of that, I even more thank you for your time and for attending this webinar. And I uh, really believe that it will be uh, of some value for you. So uh, now um, I will try to share my screen. So please uh, wait just a second. Uh, yeah. I hope that it's working. Um, that's good. That's good. Okay, great. So yeah, that's, that's the topic of uh, our today's lecture, the GDPR in impact on online uh, marketing in Europe. Uh, I'm Katarzyna Szulik, I'm a partner and attorney at law advocate, um, uh, admitted to also bar, and I specialize in uh, data protection, personal data protection, but not always, only. Um, I also practice TMT uh, law, uh, especially in the context of uh, supervised, uh, supervised um, entities and supervised by the um, Polish Financial Supervisory Authority. So uh, I do a lot of stuff that is related not only to data protection, but, but uh, um, also to IT contracts. Um, privacy uh, not notice and rules and regulations for uh, websites. Um, all um, those stuff that's related to telecommunication law. Um, so um, please uh, place me uh, in a broader context than only GDPR, um, because I think that there are very um, different types of um, uh, topics and problems that are uh, partially related to GDPR, and I'm also a lawyer that practice uh, those areas of law. So um, I would like to uh, tell you uh, just a few uh, words about SSW, uh, because this is a law firm that is uh, on the market for some time, uh, uh, more than 10 years, so this is kind of an achievement, I would say. Uh, but still uh, not all, uh, especially young lawyers, are aware of existence of SSW. Uh, so um, there are more than 170 people in uh, SSW for now. But I know that uh, in the coming months, in the first quarter of 2021, we will have more than 200 um, employees on board in SSW. So uh, please think about the SSW as a pretty big law firm. And we have various types of practices, not only related to IP, TMT, data protection, but all, all kinds of practices that you can imagine. So if you are not just into um, new technologies and stuff like this, you are, of course, um, uh, invited to apply to SSW and to join other practices of our law firm. For example, employment law, um, capital markets, and and stuff like this. And uh, then I would like to talk to, uh, talk to you about my uh, practice, data protection practice. And uh, here you have um, some examples of uh, my um, last projects. Um, I would like to underline that uh, data protection is not only about uh, GDPR compliance implementation, especially now. Because, um, as you know, GDPR is in a force for some time already, and therefore um, problems are more complicated now. And um, very often we are, uh, we are um, able to advise on <clears throat> such sophisticated problems as, for example, Internet of Things and data protection, and for example, the uh, interrelation between um, PSD2 and banking law and data protection. Uh, we have um, a lot of problems related to cloud computing and the Polish uh, Financial Supervisory Authority uh, statement on uh, cloud computing. In the context uh, of GDPR, we have a lot of problems there. So we certainly uh, advise to financial institutions and bank payments uh, institutions. So um, I think that the modern practice of data protection is not only about GDPR because uh, there is not um, enough you know, work in this very specific area. You need to have something more 
than only uh, GDPR in order to have a clients uh, and to have a work. So uh, that's uh, why we combine different types of, of uh, work uh, in, in our practice. And for now, uh, I have um, my practice combined with IP practice of another partner of SSW, Jakub Kowalski, and together we have four shared employees uh, of different seniority. So um, while Jakub is mostly, um, is mostly focused on um, IP and gaming sector, I'm more about financial institutions and uh, GDPR. And then I would uh, just like to mention that uh, SSW is not only a law firm, we have also accounting and finance uh, entity. Uh, and we also have kind of family office. And I think this is really interesting because um, we are able to, to serve our clients not only about um, law and legal problems. So we are also able to uh, seek uh, financing uh, for our startup clients and then to uh, find very interesting startups for uh, investors that have um, some kind of money that they want to invest. And um, without further ado, I would like to uh, show you what will be uh, the content of our today's lectures. Um, I would like to talk to you about um, four main topics. Uh, first one is uh, basic rules for electronic marketing messages. The second one uh, is website functionalities. A third one, legal requirements and good practices for using cookies and similar uh, mechanisms. And the, uh, the fourth one is who is who in direct marketing and why does it matter? Since I'm not sure whether all of you are familiar um, with uh, basic concepts of GDPR, I really need to talk about it right now. And I'm really sorry about some of you guys that I know that, um, uh, know a lot about GDPR because I've seen, I've seen your, um, your uh, posts on LinkedIn, for example. But some of you, I'm sure, I'm, uh, are not very familiar with GDPR. So I will uh, touch upon uh, three main um, concepts that are present in GDPR and they are really uh, crucial for today's lecture. First one is that uh, we have uh, two main types of entities uh, in GDPR. We have data controllers and we have data processors. So if we are, um, if you are an entity that is um, um, that uh, decides about the purposes of, of and methods of data processing, and uh, you are the main uh, decisive entity. Uh, in relation to personal data of a particular um, natural person, you are a data controller. So um, if we have a data processor, namely an entity that helps, uh, works for data controller and uh, that process data um, in, the, on the, uh, in order to fulfill the purposes that were decided by the data controller, this is a data processor. And a very simple, um, simple example of data uh, controllers and data processors are, for example, when we have uh, one entity that uses, for example, an um, IT company uh, that provides servers. So in this example, data controllers is the main entity and this IT entity is a data and processors and in the context of marketing, for example, we could have a marketing uh, agency that sends um, marketing campaigns uh, for the purposes established by data controllers. In here, the main company that controls data of particular uh, natural person is data controller and then we have data processor, namely this marketing agency. And then uh, the second thing is that um, personal data is a very broad concept. I mean, it's not only uh, your name and surname, and for example, a PESEL number, that is your personal data. Um, every piece of information uh, that could be linked to you and say something about you, uh, basically is personal data. So if we have, for example, your purchases history, uh, in uh, e-commerce or you have information about your IP address, um, basically it could be 
your personal data as long as uh, it could be linked to you. So I, I say about it because it's not so obvious as it turns out. Uh, I have many clients from different sectors, um, especially those new technology sectors. And for example, there, there are sometimes claim that IP address or some kind of ID numbers or for example, information about uh, behaviors um, in the internet is not personal data. So uh, I very often I need to start from the beginning by explaining what does it mean uh, and what is and what is not a personal uh, data. So this is like the uh, real flavor of, of uh, uh, working as a lawyer because um, sometimes we are not uh, um, subject to very complicated legal problems. We have only this very simple um, explanation to the clients about what is personal data. So this is this is really funny because then we got into very specific problems, but this needs to be a bottom line and you need to explain to your client. And the third thing is that you need to have a ground for uh, processing personal data. So, uh, of course, you could um, use consent uh, as a basis for, um, uh, for processing personal data, but there are many different uh, other grants uh, for processing personal data. So we have, for example, legitimate interest and we have uh, the situation when processing is necessary for a fulfillment of an agreement with a data subject, for example. And then you have uh, Article 6 and Article 9, of GDPR, and uh, here you have uh, possible grants for uh, personal uh, data. So this was the uh, introduction, uh, and sorry for everyone who was already familiar with it, but uh, surely uh, still we have many situations when um, uh, some, uh, some lawyers are not familiar with GDPR concept, especially young lawyers, could not be exposed uh, to, to this knowledge, so they had to do that. So uh, here we go to basic rules for electronic marketing messages um, and the issue of con uh, consent. And please bear in mind that according to GDPR, you could have different grants for uh, processing of personal data. So uh, here we go to uh, what is direct marketing. So, Direct marketing is transfer of information, materials about offer, product services and discounts, and promotional and advertising uh, materials. And uh, you uh, disseminate those materials in order to evoke a specific re reaction of a given person, encourage the purchase of good services, and promote the brand image. So um, you need to be mindful of the fact that any kind of communication like this is a uh, direct marketing. So it doesn't uh, matter that um, you uh, don't want to make someone to buy something uh, in order to find that something is direct marketing. Uh, also giving information about, um, uh, brand, uh, about brand and creation of a positive brand image could be uh, direct marketing. marketing. Um, on the other hand, uh, some information is not a direct marketing and uh, are not those information is not within the the concept of direct marketing uh, in the laws that i will refer to later uh, so some kind of uh, activities do not qualify as marketing for example providing information related to execution of an agreement so if you uh, ordered something via internet and then you uh, get information about time of the delivery or about the status of your delivery and about the, the status, um, about the time of delivery, then this is not uh, marketing. So those kind, kind of information are not within the, the scope of, of the rules that I will talk about later on. And here you have further, uh, further uh, examples on the slide. So uh, you could uh, have a look, uh, but um, I would say that when in doubt, uh, please go for the conclusion that something is uh, marketing uh, because there are some kind of a gray area and clients are really um, keen on, <laughs> on finding that something is not marketing while it is. Um, so 
Here we have a um, um, slide about possible grounds for processing of personal data on the basis of GDPR. So basically, um, you could use either legitimate interests as a basis uh, for processing of personal data or uh, consent. So if we uh, use um, legitimate interest, we need to have kind of a relation with the data subjects, namely a natural person, um, that uh, personal uh, data of this natural person is processed by you. And uh, this, this uh, relation needs to be uh, relevant and appropriate. Um, and uh, when we have, for example, a situation uh, where uh, there is a client uh, and an entity, and this, this client, for example, buys something from this entity, we could claim that um, the basis for processing of personal data of this data subject um, is a legitimate interest. While if we don't have this kind of relation, uh, we should rely on consent as a basis for uh, personal data um, processing. So no link, consent. But this is not the end of the story, of course, because the title of this lecture is the relation between GDPR and direct marketing uh, laws and regulations that are specific uh, for Poland. So here we go to the essence of the problem. So um, that's okay that we have a basis for processing of personal data. Uh, according to GDPR, but then we have two other acts that relates to, to that relate to um, direct marketing and the uh, grounds for processing of data. So first we have Article 10 of the Act on Provided Services by Electronic Means, and then we have Article 172 of the Communication Laws. So uh, even though you could process personal data of your clients on the basis of legitimate interest. And basically, uh, if a client uh, could expect you to send him or her uh, some kind of uh, information about its uh, you know, brand or new promotions, you need to be also compliant with the Act on Provided Services by Electronic Means. And according to Article 10 of this Act, it's prohibited to send unsolicited commercial information addressed to a designated recipient who is a natural person by means of electronic communication, in particular electronic email. And uh, kind of a similar, similar um, provision we have uh, in the um, communication, telecommunication uh, laws. So, um, um then we have this kind of table i think that it could be um it could be helpful for you uh here we we see um basis uh, of um processing of personal data and sending uh, direct marketing and different types of methods of sending those uh, those marketing uh, information for example, if we have um, written communication marketing information, then you could process data for this purpose, for sending this um, type of marketing information. Uh, you could use either consent or legitimate interest on the basis of GDPR. Then if we have a situation of sending communication via uh, email, even though you could send the uh, information via email on the basis of legitimate interest, you need to have consent on the basis of the act of uh, on the provision of electronic uh, services. So this is really important because even though you are not bound, you are not obliged to have consent on the basis of uh, GDPR, you could be bound and obliged to have the consent on the basis of the act and provision of electronic services. And uh, we have very similar situation in the context of um, contact by uh, phone, calling someone. Then you could have, for example, a uh, um, legitimate interest basis on the basis of uh, GDPR, but then you also need to have a consent under the telecommunication uh, laws. So this table basically addresses those all types of situations that we could have. Uh, and I think it, it could be uh, pretty, uh, pretty useful for you. 
And uh, then we have a very, I would say, common problem. Uh, personally, <laughs> I, I have it all the time because um, I uh, get a lot of emails, uh, especially emails, uh, with um, asking uh, when somebody asks me uh, to give him or her my consent to send further promotional uh, emails and to talk further about his or her offer and very special price on printing or some kind of, you know, uh, Google Analytics or, or a different kind of, you know, um, services that could be of, um, of uh, useful for me. And then uh, it is legal just to ask someone, okay, now I, I do not send you a spam, direct marketing without your consent, but I'm just asking you whether I could, uh, I could um, do it uh, in the future. Uh, so, uh, so basically um, the Office of Competition and Consumer Protection uh, said uh, in the future, in the past, that this is not allowed. Um, basically, the idea behind the, the telecommunication laws and behind the Act on Provision of Electronic Services is to protect someone's uh, privacy. Um, and uh, if so, uh, it is not allowed to ask someone, okay, uh, can I send you my uh, offers in the future? Because sending this email is already uh, spam and already an uh, unsolicited uh, commercial. Um, information. I think that is a pretty uh, uh, logic um, conclusion, but I will talk about it um, later on because we have uh, this situation uh, when you compare a Polish uh, legal system and uh, European approaches to uh, direct marketing, especially, for example, in Sweden. Um, you have a very different approach to consent. Although this is all based upon European uh, directives, uh, directives are not very clear about whether you are, um, as a country, you are obliged to have this opt-in or opt-out uh, approach to consent. I will talk about it later on, um, but uh, this causes a lot of problems uh, in the end. Uh, so uh, then. And what are the, uh, the requirements for a lawful uh, consent? Um, we have uh, some um, issues about and some requirements about consent in the GDPR, of course. And uh, we also have some um, requirements of consent uh, in the Polish laws. But in the end, uh, we could say, for the purpose of simplicity of this lecture, I would say that those requirements are, are really similar. Um, first of all, uh, consent should be freely given and informed. What does it mean? Um, informed consent is a consent when you present the basic information about yourself and about the purpose of processing of personal data and the type of information that you are going to send to someone who uh, gives you his or her consent to, to, to being sent this, this information. And uh, freely given, you cannot, uh, you cannot um, I would say, induce someone to give consent by you know, some kind of shady, shady methods. Uh, and then, uh, all the time, every time you collect uh, consent, you need to inform the data subject about the possibility to withdraw the consent at any time. And this withdrawal uh, need to be uh, very easy and fast. So basically, here you have two examples uh, of wrong and correct um, messages uh, linked to um, consent solicitation communication. So uh, what is really important is to give um, someone a possibility to withdraw consent as easy as it was given. For example, if you collect, if you collect consent and you use ticking boxes uh, on a web page, and then you require someone to withdraw a, a consent by sending an email to a data protection officer, or for example, I've seen it. I've seen it also an uh, um, example of um, requirement of sending a withdrawal of consent uh, in a written form 
to the physical actors of an entity that collect the consent. So then you have a situation that uh, giving consent is really easy to just tick boxes or you have a pre ticked boxes. And then if you want to withdraw the consent, you need to, to do something more and you need to inform the data protection officer about your will to withdraw that consent. So in comparison, it's really easy to give a consent and really difficult to withdraw it. So the wrong approach is that you um, uh, have the uh, scheme like this. If you want to withdraw your consent, click your the link below. And then you ask someone why you would like to withdraw your consent. We are, we are very upset about your will to, to withdraw and consent. And please think about it once again. Uh, once again. So I've seen a situation like this. And for example, I've seen a situation if I click on the link that's, for example, in an email, uh, and it's supposed to be easy to uh, withdraw my consent by clicking this email. And then I have this uh, requirement of uh, uh, login. I need to put uh, my email address and my password. And I don't remember my password for this particular site because this is kind of, you know, very old uh, thing that I did in the future. I consented to someone uh, and then they're asking me for my password in order to withdraw my consent. This is not very user friendly, I would say. Um, and uh, then the correct approach is just to, if you want to withdraw your consent, click the link below. Uh, we are uh, redirected to the specific page where we could very easily um, withdraw our consent. And then uh, we have the information about uh, successful withdrawal of the consent. So I think this is really the correct approach, and I don't really think about, uh, I don't really see any kind of, you know, explanation for having some kind of, you know, complicated procedure for withdrawal of consent for marketing purposes, especially because, you know, this is my free will that I want you to send me your promotional uh, information, and then I don't want to have it anymore. So please respect my, my choice and just uh, stop uh, sending me those emails. So um, there are some more information about the correct consent. Uh, the consent should be clearly um, un unambiguous and specific, and it should indicate the channels of communication it covers, the purpose for which it's given, and the entity to which it's given. And this is really important. This is also the uh, requirement uh, that stems from uh, that stems from um, GDPR that uh, we need to be very clear about the um, entity that is going to process personal data of particular data subject, and uh, we really need to be very specific about purposes of sending, uh, for example, uh, information or processing data. Because if you just say that I will uh, give you some interesting information, and then you you send your promotional materials, it could be it could be questionable. I would say, um, I would prefer very specific, but at the same time very user friendly approaches to this, and also in terms of having a very friendly uh, design of a consent solicitation, please do not put like 10 separate boxes on one page, just group the relevant things in, in uh, one uh, consent solicitation inquiries, and then uh, collect those, those uh, ticks um, near those boxes. So then um, it's really important, it's very common that uh, someone collects um, consent for um, for um, marketing purposes of our partners or third, third parties uh, with whom we are cooperating and those partners some group of partners will send you information about their businesses and their promotional uh, information i don't think this is correct because i'm not really sure as a data subject uh, who is going to contact me uh, why what the partners will send me, what kind of information it will be, it is interesting for me, or this is completely irrelevant for my purposes. So if you do something like this, please put uh, the names of the companies. This is the best approach. So if you are going to, if you are going to um, um, process those data and transfer those data 
for example, to your partners or, for example, to entities from the same group of companies in order to enable them to contact data subjects for their marketing purposes, you need to be really, uh, really specific about uh, um, those entities. And uh, if not, uh, we have a clear violation not only of um, Act on Provision of Electronic Health Services, but also of GDPR, because those entities do not have a ground for uh, data, personal data processing. And this is a clear violation of GDPR and is subject to a fine. So um, this is a similar thing, the last uh, point on the slide, the consent should not be given joint, jointly for several entities. And we really need to um, give a data subject a possibility to give consent, for example, for, for one entity and not for the other. So um, I've seen this uh, in practice. Maybe you are thinking whether this is a practical problem or not, but I did have several problems with direct marketing, also in the context uh, of, for example, chatbots. I had a case when um, one very big entity um, worked with a small Polish entity, and this small Polish entity created a chatbot for this big company. This is a very big international company. So then when they had this chatbot, uh, you have uh, boxes and the, in the original version of the uh, boxes, you have a joint uh, consent for sending commercial information, marketing information for this big international firm and this uh, small Polish uh, company that created this chatbot. So this is a clear uh, violation of transparency rules and some other rules of GDPR. So uh, I really think that it is not possible to, um, to approach this problem in this way uh, without violation of uh, data subject rights. And um, then um, some examples, practical examples, how uh, we could approach this. So the wrong, the wrong approaches. I agree for X and partners X to send me commercial information on new products and services by email. As I said, we, we cannot combine consent for several entities in the one uh, one solicitation uh, and and one um, request for for a consent. And uh, then we have a better approach. I agree that X and partners X who this is available at we get at least a possibility to data subject to see the list of those entities. And for example, we could have like, I don't know, 10 or, or 20 entities. This is not really okay. Uh, and, but I would say that it's better than the other one. And then we have a correct approach. Uh, I agree to the sending of commercial information on new products and services by email via X. And then I agree for X to send me commercial information on new products and services by email. Uh, so this is the approach that we need to, to uh, apply um, and uh, it's really important also it's necessary to provide uh, appropriate systematic solutions so which will ensure uh, that who, when and what consent was given is recorded. So this is really about uh, your, um, your obligation under GDPR, but also obligation under the communication law and the act on provision of electronic services and uh, maybe you are wondering whether this could be a problem uh, from the point of view of a particular company that collects these consents and sends uh, these marketing campaigns. Yes, it could be. I mean, especially when someone um, had, had, when an entity has a very big uh, list of, um, of emails and a potential uh, clients and uh, then um, one of this uh, person is, um, for example, has withdrawn his consent for marketing purposes. And then we have a problem in our IT system that uh, the marketing communication is sent to this person, even though this person already had withdrawn the consent. And it happened to one of my clients. And then we had uh, uh, information sent by these data subjects to the Polish supervisory authority, uh, PODO. And then PODO asked us about the situation, why it happened, what happened, what solutions we implemented after it happened. 
and uh, then you could you need to explain yourself to to the supervisor authority and very often you need to explain to the data subjects and um, I think that is not very at least for the moment it's not very um, I would say probable that uh, um, those entities will get a direct communication from the supervisory authority without any information sent before by data subjects. By data subjects are more and more aware about uh, their rights and therefore they are taking actions, they inform um, the supervisory authority and then our clients could have problems uh, with, with those issues. So it happens, believe me. And um, then it's, it's a very, very important problem right now, and I've seen it in the several due diligence um, uh, reports and due diligence uh, exercises, I would say, that um, today's companies are more and more uh, driven by data. So therefore, they want to expand the data they have and they use. And sometimes they use, um, uh, they buy databases. And then we have a database and we want to send marketing information to the people that are in, those, in this database. And you send this uh, direct marketing information about yourself to the database of person that was given to you by someone else. So, you don't really have a possibility to check whether you have in your IT, in your IT system, the correctly recorded consent and that someone did not uh, withdraw uh, this consent. And you have a real risk of being um, not compliant with GDPR, with Act on Provision of Electronic Services. Uh, and um, I would say that there are several issues that need to be taken into consideration while uh, preparing a contract with someone who sells you a database. So, um, of course, some kind of information about being compliant with requirements of the communication laws uh, and the determination of channels of future contact with the potential customer for the purpose of, uh, of uh, contact and the entity for which the consent is to be granted. And um, I think that it's especially uh, will be uh, relevant in the coming years because I really observe the, the situation where we strive for more, more data. And uh, if we uh, use anonymization and especially anonymization of personal data and then we use it, we are okay because anonymized data is not personal data according to GDPR, but if you have a name, surname and email address of a particular uh, natural person, and then you contact this person, then you need, really need to be sure that you have this consent for contacting for marketing purposes. Um, so uh, now I will talk very briefly about, um, I think quite interesting um, issue, uh, especially for uh, lawyers that have uh, international clients. Because very often we have a situation when we have an international client, for example, from France or, or uh, Great Britain, or for example, from Sweden. And then uh, those clients say, okay, we have GDPR, we have European directives on marketing. So basically uh, everyone has the same rules for marketing consents. And we will rely on legitimate uh, interest on the basis of GDPR and then on the basis of the European directive on direct marketing, we will use this uh, opt out approach to uh, marketing consent. Uh, what is uh, opt out uh, approach to marketing consent? In Poland, we have this requirement that consent need to be prior to sending uh, marketing information. It's really important. You, have, you need to have a prior consent. And for example, in Sweden and UK, you have this opt-out approach. So in the end, you could um, send to your potential clients um, information about your uh, products and services. 
and then uh, if this person receives it and tell you and uh, he tells you okay stop sending me those type of emails you are bound to stop sending emails but you could send the first email without asking uh, in Poland, we don't have this kind of situation. We have the situation when you are allowed to send a marketing uh, communication only if somebody uh, gave you the prior POSA. So in the end, if you have an international client that goes to Poland and wants to use legitimate interest uh, basis on the basis uh, in the perspective of GDPR, and then says, okay, so it's the same uh, in marketing uh, consent for, uh, for the whole Europe that you have this opt-out approach, you could be in trouble. And um, especially I think about uh, troubles with explaining why this is so different in Poland and this is very stringent. I mean, um, the same approach is in Germany, I think. So you could use this analogy to uh, Germany if you have a German client, but then you have uh, British clients, you have Swedish clients, and it's also an approach that is uh, basically uh, in the US. So you need to differentiate uh, Poland and say, uh, okay, guys, we understand that. Of course, we have these European directives, uh, and this is the basis for um, in member states to implement further uh, provisions on uh, direct marketing. And we, in Poland, we opted for this uh, very stringent approach. So uh, be mindful of the fact and be prepared to uh, be prepared for long discussions with your clients if they are going to uh, start uh, launch a, a marketing campaign in Poland and they want to do it Swedish way, not the Polish way. So uh, then I will uh, briefly go uh, through website functionalities. And then um, I think that it's really important to uh, think about the websites as a direct marketing um, tool, because uh, why those uh, websites uh, exist? I think that mostly because of the marketing issues. So uh, Article 29 Working Party, uh, the body which is uh, uh, um, responsible for uh, privacy issues um, says that every organization that maintains a website uh, should publish a privacy statement and notice on on the website i see that i have some kind of a uh, um, oh sorry i i, I skipped uh, one of my slides i will go back i wanted to see the chat but uh, it uh, disappeared from me okay i have it um which law applies to the messages sent by Polish company opt-in system to the person based in uh, Germany, opt-out system? Uh, this is a very, very good question. I mean, uh, if you are a Polish, uh, Polish company, you basically are uh, obliged to, of course, um, comply with the Polish legal system. So. If I see a person who, uh, an entity that is um, obliged to comply with the Polish laws, and then we have this kind of situation, it depends on, you know, the, the actual actions of this person that uh, sent, uh, that was, uh, that received this information that is based in Germany. But, you know, uh, we can say that this person will not be, like, practically speaking, this person will not be shocked uh, while receiving this information. Uh, but in the end, if this practice is, uh, you know, um, noticed but, uh, by the supervisory authority, I'm not sure whether it would be, uh, that this entity would be in the position to claim that this is okay. I mean, uh, basically, uh, Polish entities that are based in Poland need to comply with the Polish Act on uh, provision of electronic uh, services. But, you know, the issue of you know, jurisdiction uh, in the terms of uh, Act on provision of electronic services, this is a different uh, thing because then you have some kind of European, um, European common rules on jurisdiction in that. And this is um, outside the scope of this lecture, unfortunately, but this is really, really good question. And uh, Justina, please feel free to contact me and so we could talk about it further. But, you know, from the practical point of view, uh, you really need to think about, you know, your position 
once you have this contact with the supervisory authorities. Um, and uh, then this is really the bottom line. Uh, I have uh, one more question that is uh, kind of uh, interesting for me. Is SSW Polish law firm of the branch of international firm? This is a Polish law firm, and uh, we are really um, uh, kind of uh, independent from any kind of big brand. But then we have uh, uh, many contacts over the world, and and uh, we cooperate with uh, companies law firms in uh, UK, in France, in Germany, in Switzerland also. Um, Okay, so then, then I will go back to the transparency on the website. And um, this is really the exercise that I uh, do mostly when I um, prepare GDPR uh, compliance um, task. I mean, uh, I, de I do a due diligence of a website and I see, especially on the contact forms, uh, places where contact details are given, registration of account place, for example, in an online store and uh, post about um, the competition uh, on Facebook, for example. And um, Facebook is really important in the context of European ju jurisdiction. And I will talk about it later because it's really interesting to see how the um, Court of Justice, Justice of the European Union uh, sees uh, Facebook in the context of direct marketing and in the context of cooperation with the, uh, with the owners of the uh, websites. Um, so then, um, uh, the, some kind of a practical, uh, practical um, uh, issues that you need to take into consideration when uh, creating an account and user registration form uh, as a company. Yes, mm, it's really important to collect only personal data which is necessary to create a profile. So it's really not very wise to uh, solicit additional information that are not vital for creation of an account. So if it's possible for you to create practically, to create an account only having, for example, a name, or even not name, only an email address, please stick with the email address. Of course, if you are an e-commerce online shop, you really need to have more information uh, when creating an account or when receiving a, a request for sending uh, some kind of, you know, product on, and when you have a purchase in the end. Uh, but then really please be, be uh, very um, careful about collecting too much information. Uh, you don't, uh, uh, you don't always need to give your consent for your personal data to be processed. So, um, I mean, this is also in the context of grounds of um, processing of personal data. Uh, it's really not very useful to, co to collect consent when you don't need to have a consent for uh, processing of personal data. I'm thinking about a situation when, for example, you um, have an account creation form and then you could see this creation of this account as uh, your agreement with data subjects. Then the correct ground for processing of personal data is uh, the agreement with data subject of the consent. So um, consent is not uh, really necessary. And this is kind of, uh, you know, not very um, easy to understand uh, then for data subject that you uh, want uh, consent from him. When, for example, this person says you, I want to withdraw uh, consent uh, that I have, uh, that I uh, gave you in the past, uh, and please erase all the data about me. And then you say, okay, I will not erase data about you because uh, I have an agreement with you and I need to process your data um, because of my legitimate interest in order to uh, protect uh, my position in the future if we have, for example, kind of a, a dispute before a court. So please really try not to use um, consent as a, a ground for processing of personal data. And um, it's really important to be uh, user friendly. This is the third point of the, on the slide. Um, is um, uh, the basic information about the entity that is going to process particular uh, data, um, this information about, for example, the name of this company and the purpose for which the data will be processed need to be given in the first layer uh, of the information about uh, processing. And of course, you are not supposed to present the whole privacy notice 
every time you collect data about data subjects. Please present only the first uh, few points about the, the purpose and about the sub about the entity that is going to process personal data, and then please refer the data subject to the privacy policy uh, when um, where some uh, very interesting those topics uh, data subject could find more information about it. Uh, of course, most of us do not read um, privacy notices. Of course, I'm, I'm biased in favor of, of uh, um, reading it. And I do it on a regular basis, but I can imagine that mostly people do not uh, do it. So please do not overwhelm your data subject with information that is not very often very relevant for these persons. Um, because I have uh, uh, not uh, much time uh, left, uh, given the amount of slides that I, I have, I will skip the rest of things on this particular slide and I will go um, uh, to the next one. And uh, if I have time, I will uh, go back to it in the future um, because we have like uh, half. Um, I think that is uh, more, more important to uh, be aware of the recent developments of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union and um, uh, especially about the uh, ruling about plugins because in this uh, plugins um, ruling that I will talk about later we had a very revolutionary, uh, revolutionary um, uh, approach uh, to plugins on websites uh, because uh, you need to, uh, really need to be aware about um, having those plugins and not informing, for example, data subjects about it in the privacy notice. This is the number one um, bad thing to do because uh, sometimes if someone is uh, uh, someone uh, visits uh, your your web page, your website. Um, data of those subjects are automatically transferred to uh, social media um, pages. And this is uh, possible with special plugins that are in the code of the, of the website. And then uh, this is really important thing to say in the privacy notice, because this is kind of uh, uh, very, um, I would say, invasive uh, to privacy. And uh, I think that data subjects uh, would like to know about it. So um, I will talk about the, the judgment later on, uh, but for now, I really think that it's really important to be uh, mindful of the fact that uh, informing about plugins in the privacy notice is, is really important. I, I will try to see the chat because I, will, I have another question, I think. Uh, yes, I, I, will, I will share the... Uh, number of the pages, uh, of course. Okay, so uh, the next slide. Um, transparency and minimization on the website. Um, um, I really think that um, this is the issues. Those are the issues that uh, need to be presented somewhere on the website. Uh, for example, uh, I, I talked about uh, chatbots a uh, few minutes uh, ago, and I think that chatbots is a really interesting uh, issue, but I think that we don't have time to really dwell into it because you have um, the issue related, for example, to um, artificial intelligence in chatbots. Very often you have kind of uh, machine learning mechanism in chatbots, and then you have uh, very often have profiling. So profiling is very intrusive for privacy. And um, every time someone is going to use chatbot because it's so you know new and sexy, I would say now to have chatbots on websites, um, then you really need to be uh, mindful of the fact that it's very intrusive. And then um, I would say it's really wise to have assessment of the risk to the privacy because of using of this chatbot. Um, of course, uh, we need to have data processing agreements with IT solution providers. And uh, if we have a newsletter uh, function on the website, it's, I would say, uh, also advisable to have um, the frequency of sending uh, those newsletter stated, for example, in the privacy, uh, privacy notice. And then uh, I would say this, this is my uh, favorite topic. This is cookies topic. 
Um, I'm not sure whether you are very aware of the, you know, uh, number of legal problems that are linked to, to cookies. But um, what I have from what experiences I have from my uh, practice as a lawyer, um, I think that uh, especially in um, new tech um, um, enterprises, entities, cookies are treated. I, okay, we have cookies because we need to have because we need to have better offer for our client, but we really do not care about legal requirements for cookies because everyone has cookies. And everyone does not care about cookies. I will I will show you later on that some uh, supervisor authorities in Europe really do care about cookies, and uh, they find um, entities that use cookies in uh, improper way. But here you have my six favorite myths about cookies, and uh, the, the, my number one ever is my cookies do not collect personal information because we have only IP address collected. IP address in general, and this is like the, you know, this, this is established, yes? IP address is uh, uh, personal data. So if you have any doubts whether your IP address is personal data or not, it is, especially in Europe, because of course um, we have this uh, context of uh, US and US, in US the approach is quite different. But uh, in European Union, IP address is personal <laughs> information. Um, and the second one also is related to uh, telecommunication laws. Cookies regulation uh, are the same all over the Europe. It's not true. Um, and third one, everyone uses the same cookies, so I can copy the cookie policy and the banner from another site. Uh, it's, very, it's very common when I uh, do uh, have some kind of due diligence task and I look at websites of my clients and I see some kind of a cookie banner. So I ask the client, okay, you have this cookie banner. So on the basis on that, and on the basis of your cookies policy, I will prepare a better cookie policy for you and better privacy notice. And then I ask some specific question about these cookies, analytical cookies and statistical cookies. And then I uh, am informed about the fact that the banner and the cookies policy is completely wrong. I mean, it's not in order with the uh, actual state of uh, affairs. And uh, the cookie banner, I, I you know, I dive uh, deeper and deeper, and I um, look for answers, and I get answers that, uh, okay, this cookie banner was of one of our biggest competitors, so we use the same because this is a good practice in our sector. And this is not the case because very often cookies are placed by kind of a third marketing um, agencies, and but the owner of the of the website is uh, obliged to find out to find out what cookies are installed and for where what purposes, and is obliged to put it clearly in the privacy uh, notice or cookies notice or in the banner. Um, okay, so the next one, I'm not liable for any consequences for the installation of cookies without consent. Uh, we need consent for some cookies. We don't need consent for the others. I will talk about it in a minute, but there are some cookies that uh, require consent, even though they do not collect personal data. And this stems from the tele telecommunication law and we need to be mindful of this fact. And um, no, uh, you have the fifth one, uh, Facebook Pixel and uh, Google Analytics are not cookies. Okay, they are not cookies, but they are technologies that are similar to cookies. And because of this, they are within the regulation for cookies. So even though technically uh, Google Analytics or Facebook Pixel is not a cookie, um, it is within this regulation, and uh, if someone is uh, installing this on its website, it needs to be compliant with, with this regulation. And the sixth one, I don't know what cookies I use, so I'm not responsible for them. And uh, uh, please, Katarzyna, stop asking us about these cookies because we don't know, and we are not in the position to find out because we have changed our marketing agency very often. Very often, believe me, uh, I think all the time, and I need to tell you that uh, being a lawyer that, that um, tries to advise about cookies and marketing in the online sphere 
this is very challenging and especially in terms of uh, negotiation with your clients and trying to explain why, why this particular issue matters. So yeah, this, this is really a challenge. Um, yes, I've, uh, I uh, mentioned it just a second about, uh, ago. Um, there's no a clear definition about cookie, um, but this is small fragments of text that are saved on your device. And uh, there are different types of cookies, uh, basically statistical, analytical, advertising cookies. Um, so uh, what is in this table here, um, also similar technologies, uh, similar to cookies, are within this, the sphere of this regulation. So uh, then we have a situation when you have cookies that collect personal information. If you have this type of cookies, um, on the basis, because of the wording of GDPR, you are bound to have a ground for processing of those uh, personal data. So, of course, you could use uh, consent or other grounds for processing, processing of personal data. But then you also have the tele telecommunication law. And um, then um, we have different type of cookies and uh, for some of them we are not bound to uh, have uh, uh, to have a, a different consent uh, but some of them we need to have a consent for example if you um, if you install advertising cookies and you are uh, you are spying on your data subjects uh, throughout the internet you are bound to ask uh, this data subject whether you can install this cookie, um, this cookie on the device uh, of the data subject. But then if you have uh, some kind of cookies that are aimed at uh, maintaining functionalities uh, of, of the website, you are not bound to, to, to ask about it. It's the same with the security cookies. Uh, it's also okay to install them. But then uh, we have a kind of a problem with, um, with uh, statistic statistical uh, cookies. It's not very clear from the, from the um, regulations whether you need to have the consent for um, the statistical cookies. But for sure, for analytical marketing cookies, yes. Statistical, I would say yes. But uh, there is no necessity to, to have a consent for the cookies that are strictly uh, required for the functioning of the web page. So, as I said, if you have the security and functioning cookies, it's okay to install them, uh, even though uh, you don't have a consent for them. But then if you have this different type of cookies uh, uh, in here, you need to have the consent. Um, here we have some basic information about how to collect permission to install cookies. Uh, it's not okay to use the default checkbox. Uh, I mean the default checkbox that are already ticked. Yes, because we have some kind of uh, cookies uh, consent solicitation uh, that uh, look like we have this uh, little uh, checkbox and this is ticked and you need to untick it in order not to have the, the cookies um, collected and installed on your uh, device. Um, and uh, sometimes you have this kind of a method of collecting, of installing cookies and collecting consent, that for example, if you agree to um, participate in kind of a you know game lottery or something like this, automatically you uh, consent for uh, installation of cookies that spy on you throughout the internet and then profile you and send you kind of advertising. Um, and uh, you cannot also use this banner with uh, the information that if you close this uh, this box, uh, this window, you consent uh, to uh, installing to to, to uh, having uh, those cookies installed. Uh, and on your device. This is not okay. Uh, and the consent need to be active um, and this activity need to, need to be recorded. So the best way of doing it is to have a, a box that, is, that needs to be ticked by the data subject and then only after it, only after collection of the consent, you install uh, the, the cookie. Um, and general consent, um, yes, here you have uh, the uh, situation where I think this is a very good approach in the end. 
you have uh, the information about necessary cookies and you inform the data subject about uh, uh, the situation that this page uses these necessary cookies and this is really indispensable for this page to, func to function, to, to have these cookies installed. And then you have the possibility to, um, to express a consent to uh, install uh, analytics cookies. And um, when I said about the general consent, I really of the opinion that you need to have a separate um, consent for different type of cookies. I mean, if you have both analytic cookies and then statistical cookies and then advertising cookies, it's really better to have the possibility to, for example, um, consent to uh, analytical cookies and then not to consent to advertising cookies because you don't want to have, you know, uh, some kind of um, items uh, displayed to you uh, when you visit different pages. For example, if you uh, see some kind of a shoes, uh, some kind of shoes in one uh, e-commerce shop, and then you go to the news uh, page and you have this, this uh, image of these shoes um, um, displayed, uh, this is uh, because of advertising cookies. And then and I think that you need to have a consent to uh, not to not to consent uh, to this type of uh, cookies. <clears throat> I'm really sorry. I need to drink some water because I have a problem with my throat. Um, here we have the recent case law um, and decision, the case law of the um, Court of Justice of the European Union and the, some decisions of the supervisory authorities um, on um, different uh, things related to cookies especially with cookies. And uh, here we have a Planet uh, 39 uh, case. Um, and here we have um, the issue of predict uh, checkbox. Um, and in this case, we had the select to refuse consent to use the cookies. Um, and uh, this was found not to be okay and not to be uh, compliant with the relevant, uh, relevant um, uh, laws and relevant regulation. Um, and um, in, the, in the last point in here, uh, we have um, uh, some additional information that need to be presented to the data subjects, to, to the visitor of the page <laughs> in, order, in order to be transparent toward this, this person. And then I think it's really, uh, it's really good practice to inform uh, data subjects, for example, about the duration of um, installation of the cookie. Uh, because, uh, yeah, I've seen some cookies that are installed, for example, for 90 years as default. So this is a, a lot of time, I would say. And uh, personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't prefer to have uh, a, cookies, a cookie installed on my device for 50 years. Um, and then, then we have the another the another um, case law uh, about this Facebook uh, and this uh, plugin. I've said, uh, I've uh, mentioned it before, and one uh, of uh, of the person here asked me about the the number of the case. And uh, this is the Wirtschaft Wirtschaft Academy Schleswig Holstein case. And in this case. We have um, the Data uh, Protection Authority of the state of Schleswig-Holstein. Um, and um, it said that Virtual Academy, namely the organization that organizes some kind of, you know, courses, something like this, need to deactivate this Facebook fan page because according to this uh, supervisory authority, uh, visitors uh, could be collected by Facebook via cookie on the page without the visitors being informed. So uh, Richard Academy wasn't, um, wasn't very uh, happy about this, this decision of the uh, supervisory authority and uh, sought legal protection against this order. Uh, and it argued that it was not responsible, uh, responsible for the data proce processing by Facebook. Namely, the issue is that, okay, I have this plugin on my page, but I don't know what Facebook is going to do with the uh, data that it collects through this, this plugin. Um, but then we have uh, we had uh, the, the decision by the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union 
and it was uh, decided that the social media uh, language administrator is the controller, controller within the meaning of the GDPR, but even more, uh, the administrator uh, of the fan page on Facebook is a joint controller together with Facebook. So uh, in theory, uh, you as an administrator of a Facebook fan page needs to contact Facebook in order to establish your joint purposes of methods and methods of uh, data, personal data processing. So now think about it. You are, for example, a virtual academy, a small entity in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, and then you need, you are supposed, uh, according to the Court of Justice of the European Union, you are supposed to contact Facebook and you need to agree on data, personal data processing. Uh, this is really unthinkable for me. I mean, sometimes it's kind of, you know, common. Recently, a uh, Court of Justice of the European Union is trying to uh, be very protective about personal data, but then we have uh, the outcome that is absurd. For me, it is not possible to implement the findings of this ruling in practice. Okay, you could be very uh, specific and very transparent about um, Facebook usage in your privacy notice. You could have even kind of a banner that, okay, you, my dear visitor, you enters my webpage, please be informed that I use uh, Facebook plugins and I have um, a fan page uh, on Facebook and then please be informed that uh, Facebook may use your personal data um, in some ways that are out of my control, but I'm not really sure that uh, um, the owners of fan page on Facebook could contact Facebook in order to agree on methods and purposes of data processing. It's, it's really unthinkable. So please be mindful of this uh, ruling, but uh, please be mindful also of the fact that it was uh, heavily criticized. It's, it's very uh, a similar criticism as with the recent uh, Schrems, uh, the second ruling about transfers to uh, US. Um, and this ruling canceled the privacy shield. So now we have a really big problem with transfers to, to uh, the United States. And um, both this Virtuals Academy uh, case and Schrems case are great examples of very absurd results that was created by Court of Justice of the European Union. And uh, then I wanted to show you some activities of the Spanish Supervisory Authority um, about cookies. Because um, in Poland, it's not uh, very common uh, to have any kind of you know, activity in terms of cookies, but uh, the Spanish authority is, is very, very active in this area. So um, they really uh, wanted to underline that you need to have um, a ground for processing of data uh, which are collected to, through cookies. Uh, so basically Article 6 of the GDPR is about the grounds for data processing. So in two of those um, cases, uh, the Spanish Supervisory Authority uh, fined entities for not having the, the proper ground for data um, processing. And uh, in the third case, uh, you have the, the case of uh, Iberia, uh, Iberia um, and uh, Iberia failed to provide users with the option to reject cookies and instead required them to accept cookies if they wanted to continue browsing. And I think that you are pretty familiar with this method of cookies and uh, of cookies um, management of cookies collection and cookies installation. So I think it is really common in Poland to have this type of banners on the bottom of the pages. So please imagine a situation when we have um, an activity of our supervisory authority in terms of compliance uh, of the cookies management policy with GDPR and with Polish laws, uh, basically the telecommunication law. So then I think that this is only the question of time uh, when the uh, Polish supervisory authority starts 
to be active also uh, about it. And uh, frankly speaking, I think it will be it will be very beneficial for for um, users of the internet in Poland because I don't really think that Polish companies, Polish entities do care about cookies collection and all the rules that we have in place. And if we have, if we start, if we are facing more and more activity of our supervisory inter, uh, authority in this field, we will, we will see uh, that uh, those entities uh, care more about it. Um, I don't really have uh, much time. Um, I just wanted to show you some kind of um, uh, future activities because uh, still we have uh, uh, privacy uh, to be to be adopted. So this is the big the big change in terms of cookies. We will see how it, it will look in the end. Of course, we have the ongoing uh, works on the. Um, a uh, new uh, communication code and uh, in here we have um, some uh, issues about about the current regulations and proposed amendments um, really there are not so many changes in that uh, and i think uh, it's better for us to have just one uh, provision like in here than to have both both uh, article 10 uh, in the um, Act on Provision of uh, the Electronic Services and then the Article of Telecommunication Law, because for uh, someone who is not deeply into this topic, it's really uh, hard to, to comprehend uh, those issues. But then we have uh, in the proposed the communication, communication code, we have this one uh, common, uh, common uh, provision on this. So this is welcome. Um, this is so more comment about this marketing in this project, but I really want to show you, um, yes, this, this part, uh, we have only eight minutes, but I will uh, want, I want to, to show you why it doesn't matter to know who is who in direct marketing, because sometimes it could be really complicated to navigate through all the issues that you could have in GDPR, um, act on provision of electronic services and the communication act, but it's also really hard to understand who is who. So please look at this example. Uh, we have a company X and we have a company A from the same, from the same capital group uh, as the company X, which distributes the newsletter for company X because company uh, X um, does not want to do it because it's more, for example, into selling. And then um, the marketing part of operations goes to another company from the same group. And then we have company B uh, uh, with a sitting country one, which administers the website in every language version and collects marketing consents. So it collects marketing consents for different um, companies from the same group of companies. And then we have contractor one who runs uh, the, the fan page on Facebook. Then we have the contractor, the second contractor who runs marketing campaigns on behalf of company B, of course. And then we have a, a third contractor who conducts the controller's customer satisfaction service. So um, this is really complicated landscape. And um, it's really uh, useful first to have a kind of a table, I would say. In this table, you uh, just check whether, uh, for example, a company X is a controller of personal data. Uh, and uh, of course, you need to mention what kind of data this company controls. Because please be mindful of the fact that in this scenario, it could be that in some, uh, to some extent, the company X is a data controller, but for example, for another type of personal data, uh, this company X is a data processor. Uh, it's the same with all those companies in there. Of course, of course, in this scenario, as I said, uh, company X is pu purely um, a controller of personal data. But for example, company A or contractor uh, the second, uh, the first, uh, could be both um, a controller or processor, or even it could be a joint controller with some other uh, company from this scenario. Uh, especially um, in the context of those plugins, uh, Facebook plugins. And for example, please imagine a situation when you 
uh, when you send, uh, when you only tell your um, parent, your uh, sister company that you want to sell, to send a marketing campaign, and then um, tells this, this company, for example, A, okay, send it. So who is the data controller? Uh, it seems that uh, company X is data controller because it says, please send this, but then it doesn't control the anything about sending this, this, uh, this uh, marketing campaign. Um, I think it is uh, very interesting to look uh, at particular cases and to find proper arguments whether someone is data uh, processor or data controller. It's really crucial. And I would say that even that it's, it's, it's more difficult than it seems so, because um, there are some kind of recommendations on that uh, issued by the relevant, uh, relevant uh, European authorities. And there is still a lot of questions of whether, for example, uh, accounting uh, firm is a data processor or data controller. Of course, in Poland, we have this quite clear um, uh, approach right now that uh, accounting firms are for sure uh, data controllers. But in the, in the past, we had a lot of discussion about it and it was not sure whether uh, accounting firms uh, are controllers or, or processors. And I don't really have much time left, but I wanted to uh, show you this because I think that this, um, uh, this uh, table, this thing, uh, this mapping, uh, is uh, the the you know the heart of um, uh, of my work because I think that mm, if you work on uh, processing of personal data you really need to think about uh, the whole picture and um, what I do when I work um, I put all the information that I have in this visual form because it's easier to comprehend uh, you know relation between different. Uh, different companies in the landscape. So if you have a main company, uh, let's imagine that this company uh, was my client. Uh, you have the customer of this company and it's really the company who wants to sell something to the customer. And then uh, you could have uh, employees of this company. You could have the website uh, that is managed by the company. You have here, you have the methods of collection of, of data. But then here you have some, um, you know, related uh, affiliated companies affiliated to this, this main company that took place, that uh, have uh, some kind of a role in this process. And for example, that are intermediaries between the main company and uh, third parties that uh, process data uh, as uh, data uh, processors that um, I think it's, it's really, really impor important to put something uh, like this in place and to, to work on it uh, when you prepare anything related to uh, personal data. So uh, I really recommend it to you if you happen to, to work on personal data, please, please start uh, with data mapping. Okay, I, I think, uh, I think I, I'm done. Uh, with my presentation. Uh, I think this is uh, really uh, good timing of me. Uh, <laughs> I could, I could uh, also look at the question that I have on the chat. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, privacy regulation is um, not going to change much. As I said, uh, this uh, new communication law um, is, is going to have some minor changes to the uh, uh, current uh, situation, but not very kind of you no know, revolution for now. Um, yeah, I have another question. How useful is the knowledge of other regulation languages, not English, while working in a law firm like uh, SSW? Yeah, this is a really good question. We have uh, a German desk, uh, and German desk works uh, not only with Germany, but also with uh, Switzerland. And uh, yeah, mainly with uh, German and Switzerland, uh, we also have Chinese desk and we uh, are trying to expand into this market and to get clients from uh, China. Uh, so if uh, somebody is ha uh, happens to know uh, Chinese, uh, please be welcome. But then um, I think that we are open to, um, ah, okay, and we have a Korean desk. 
And um, I think that it's really good to know other languages because uh, we are still in the phase of uh, expansion, I would say. And uh, for me personally, I really prefer uh, people who know French uh, and who know uh, Spanish because there are um, many interesting rulings and decisions in those languages. And for example, if you don't have the instant translation of something into English, it's really useful to look at the French uh, version and uh, to be the first in the Polish internet to inform our clients or our potential clients about this development that stems, uh, the development that stems for a particular uh, French or Spanish decision. So I, I think that uh, we are just on time. Um, I don't see any uh, uh, questions. So thank you all so much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and please feel free, I really mean it, feel free to contact me via LinkedIn. I, I'm very open to conversation, um, conversation with you. And uh, again, Steve, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I hope I did pretty well. <laughs> At least I tried. Um, yeah, and the floor is yours. It was great. It was great. Thank you so much, Kasia. The, the wonderful thing is seeing that you, this is obviously a topic you're extremely passionate about, and and if we had the time, could could say a lot lot more about. So I, I hope we'll be able to invite you back sometime and give you some more time to talk to talk about some of the some of the issues that you raised because I think it, it was fascinating. Um, I have many questions. Um, I I have the opportunity me? to ask you um, a little bit later. One of them is, uh, I, it seems like I may need Mark Zuckerberg's telephone number. Um, for based on some of the things that you've said during the uh, during the session, that um, we may be needing to contact Facebook our, our, ourselves with, with with all of this. Yeah. Um, but uh, could I just say then for for now, thank you so much to you, to to SSW as a whole, um, and of course to the to the Coronet Kobi on on intellectual property, uh, and to you all, to everyone who who has joined us. Um, now if this is your first BLC event please make sure to stay in contact. We've got lots more interesting and fun things uh, coming up even before Christmas. So, so this evening, for example, on the BLC's YouTube channel, you'll be able to see a premiere of an interview that I, that I did recently with uh, Lord Justice Green of the UK's Court of Appeal. Next Monday, we have a, a lecture on intellectual property rights management in the gaming industry um, and some lawyers from Queen Mary University and the general counsel of CD Projekt, Red, and they're the creators of Cyberpunk, will be talking about IP rights management within the context of, of, of games. Next Wednesday, uh, we, we're taking a step away from, from law, and we're going to have a, a Christmas quiz, which is hosted by Professor uh, Alistair Hodge. It's not about law questions, uh, so you get to put on your Christmas jumper and get some mulled wine out uh, to watch that. And next Thursday, we're, we're going to be joined by Kasia's colleague, Jakub Kubalski, who's going to be talking about intellectual property issues in relation to artificial intelligence. So IP in AI, and then AI in IP. Um, and on top of that, of course, for, for the regular BLC students, um, next week, they'll be having lectures from Professor Paul McMahon of the London School of Economics. So lots of stuff. If you want to keep in contact with us and what we do, Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, all the normal social media things. I will now uh, go and check out our cookies policy based upon everything that Kasia has said. Kasia, once again, thank you so much. Uh, and to everyone, good night. And uh, good night. See, you, see you all. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very Bye. much. Goodbye. Bye.